My name is Patricia Goth, and I teach in the Political Science Department at Wilfrid Laurier University and in the Balsillie School of International Affairs. And it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening to the Center for International Governance Innovation for this book launch of Getting Back in the Game by Mr. Paul Heinbecker. Uh, I would like to invite all of you to stay after our event this evening for wine and cheese and also for the opportunity to chat with the author and for the opportunity to purchase the book. You might notice that we're going to try a little different format this evening. We're going to have a chat. We're going to have a chat. Going to have a chat. And after we've had a little chat, then we're going to ask you to join us in that chat. And you'll notice that there's a microphone over to your left. And if anyone wishes to pose a question, we'll ask you to step to the microphone and we'll identify you at that time. Paul Heinbecker is a distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation, and he is also on faculty at Wilfrid Laurier University. He has been called the Dean of Canadian Diplomats. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> he is a career diplomat. He has been posted to Canadian embassies in Turkey, in Sweden, in Washington, D.C., and also to the Canadian delegation of the OECD in Paris. From 1992 to 1996, he served as our ambassador to Germany. He has served a number of prime ministers, and I think we'll hear a little bit about some of that this evening. Perhaps notably, or most notably, he served Prime Minister Brian Mulroney as his chief foreign policy advisor and speechwriter, and subsequently as assistant secretary to the cabinet for foreign and defense policy. He was an architect of Canada's human security agenda and lead Canadian negotiator of the Kyoto Climate Change Accord. He headed the Interdepartmental Task Force on Kosovo and as Canada's G8 political director, helped to negotiate an end to that war. His last diplomatic assignment was as permanent representative of Canada to the United Nations in New York, where in the year 2000, he represented Canada on the Security Council, and we may touch on that issue here this evening. Possibly. Uh, in his capacity as permanent rep uh, to the United Nations, he participated in deliberations on the Middle East, on Afghanistan, on Sierra Leone, and Angola. He was a leading advocate of the responsibility to protect doctrine and a defender of the International Criminal Court. So I would say that there is probably nobody better able to help us understand Canadian foreign policy, and we're thrilled that you're here with us Thank this you. evening. We're probably doubly thrilled because he's a Waterloo boy. He is a graduate of WLU, which was, at that time, Waterloo Lutheran University, but of course is now Wilfrid Laurier University, and he is a recipient of an honorary law degree from, a uh, doctorate of law from Wilfrid Laurier University, which was presented to him in 1993, and 10 years later he was uh, named our alumnus of the year. So he is he has been honored by the university where he now has a very important affiliation and we're proud to have him on faculty. We're also happy that he's channeled this uh, very distinguished career set of experiences into what I hope will be his first single authored book entitled Getting Back in the Game, a foreign policy playbook for Canada. It appeared with Key Porter Books earlier this month and we're going to talk about it and around it, and I ask you at this time to please join me in welcoming Paul Heinbecker to the stage. So Paul, I mentioned that you're a Waterloo boy. You somehow managed to get from WLU to the heights of the Canadian Foreign Service. How did you do it? Sure luck. <laughs> um, I've, I come from uh, Kitchener and Waterloo, so I'm a r real local citizen. I spent most of my growing up years on Union Street uh, in Waterloo. Do we have a feedback? Am I hearing feedback? Is it okay? Can't hear? Let's keep doing a check and we'll... We're hearing a little feedback. We're hearing some feedback. Not, okay. No, but uh, I think... Can the people in the back row hear anyway? And the people in the front row here. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. Uh, yeah, I was, um, how did I get there? I was, a, I was a going to Laurier. I was not a good student. 
I remember when I came back from my doctorate, uh, one of the professors said, it's at this point where I'm, going, I'm supposed to say what a remarkable student you were and how well I remember you, but the fact is I don't remember you at all. <laughs> uh, and the feeling was mutual, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's real feedback. That's worthy of Jimmy Hendrix. Are we on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was playing with, uh, I, I expected to be a football player. I, I didn't expect to be a, a, a diplomat. Uh, I was with uh, the, what's now the Laurier Golden Hawks. And uh, one night after practice, it was raining too hard, and it was too cold to make the long walk down to uh, King Street from, uh, from the university. So I stopped, uh, and I looked in the hallway, and it said, Foreign Service Exam tonight in, the, in front of the room. So I said, I'd, I'd heard that you know, working for the government was a pretty rich deal. So I, I said, OK, I'll, I'll write the Foreign Service Exam, because I can't go home anyway. So I wrote the foreign service exam with absolutely no expectations, which is probably the best way to write an exam. And uh, I passed. And then, I got, uh, the, then it became more difficult. I got a letter from the Edmonton Eskimos drafting me and a letter from the foreign service hiring me on exactly the same day. This is a lovely problem to have. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do about that, except that I, I remember watching television, and they were used to show these football games from Edmonton in the wintertime. <laughs> and it was all, you know, the ground was frozen and there were snow banks on the sides and I decided that, uh, and, I, and I had heard somewhere that uh, the average fo football career lasted uh, f five years uh, and, I, and I also noted that in the offer of letter, letter of offer from the Foreign Affairs Department they were paying more than the Edmonton Eskimos were. <laughs> so I joined. Uh, and I didn't really know much about it. I, I thought it was, you know, like joining the Foreign Legion, sort of. I'd seen the Beau Geste and the other movies of the age and, you know, deserts and, 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 and fortresses and camels and all that. So I thought that looked like a pretty interesting life. Uh, it turned out to be a little bit more banal than that. I did get shot at once, though. Where was my, that? Uh, my first posting was in Turkey. Uh, I was called into personnel and they said, how would you like to go to Ankara? And I said, I'd love to go to Ankara. And they said, great, we're sending you to Ankara. So I went back to my office and looked up where Ankara was. Because <laughs> I, I actually didn't know. I, I told you I wasn't a very good student. <laughs> uh, so off I went to, uh, to Ankara, and I started playing golf. Uh, and one of the guys I used to play golf was, with was an American editor of a local Turkish newspaper, an English, ver English language version of the paper. So we were out golfing, and all of a sudden we heard gunshots, and then we heard them, you know, more or less instantaneously going over our heads, which was the good part. Uh, and uh, so we dove on the ground. Uh, I remember that and tried to figure out where these shots were coming from and, and why anybody might have been shooting at us. And it was a tradition in Turkey in those days that people would shoot, you know, at weddings. They would fire guns and it was kind of a celebration. And so we had thought that that's probably what was going on because we could see there was a wedding somewhere in the distance. But we weren't quite sure and I was up quite a bit of money at, the point, at this point. So we decided that we would complete the round. Uh, so I ran up on top of the tee, hit the ball and then dove off down behind it again. And he did the same thing, and then we crawled, literally, for a while. <laughs> and, we, and we finished the round. It turned out later, he was a CIA agent. And somebody, I think, was sending a, me a message. Uh, he didn't reveal that to me at the time, but uh, he was later arrested in Syria for uh, conduct so, unbecoming. <laughs> for the sake of the students in the audience, let's just disabuse them yes. of the idea that one can get into the Foreign Service on a whim and one will play most of, spend most of their time playing golf. Do we have to do that? <laughs> I think for their <laughs> That was the most. No, it, I, I wanted to make the point that it's so different today than it was then. Boy, we had no concerns about getting jobs. We had no concerns about careers. I, I, you know, if I hadn't got the Foreign Service, I, it wouldn't have bothered me in the slightest. I hadn't prepared for it. Uh, these days, if you want to get into the Foreign Service, the last the last uh, round, there were 10,000 applicants 
100 got jobs. That's 1%. Uh, and they, they have preposterous exams uh, that are so difficult and so obscure just to give themselves some way of reducing the number of people they have to consider. For a while, they were putting engineering questions. If there are engineers in the audience, it might, you might find this attractive. They're putting engineering questions into the Foreign Service exam in order to be able to throw people out who couldn't answer the question. So now it's become, uh, it's become very, very competitive. It couldn't be more competitive. And the, and the students who are showing up are, are so much better prepared than we, are, we were better educated, what much more experienced, much more savvy, much more worldly. Uh, really, uh, if I were to present myself today the way I presented myself then, I'd be one of the 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. No, good to <laughs> That's know. For good sure. clarification. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you write this book? My sense is that you probably could have written a number of books at this stage, given your different experiences. Why did you choose to write this one on getting back in the game the playbook for Canadian foreign policy? I had no idea. We, 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 uh, we, uh, we sort of agonized over the title for quite a long time, getting back in the game. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a former football player, a broken down ex-football player, and maybe, you know, there's something appropriate about uh, the game metaphor. Uh, little did I know that uh, in the second week in October, the government would fall, of Canada would fall out of the game altogether, at the UN at least. So that we really do have to think about how to get back in the game because we've basically been dismissed by the international community. And we can talk about that in some detail if you want. But I, I wrote the book really because if you read the book, you'll find it's a very optimistic take on Canada. I am very optimistic. We, we've never been richer, we've never been better educated, we've never been better connected. We've never been more secure. We've never had greater opportunities than we have now. This is a, this, you know, that's one thing. Our assets, our, our, our universities uh, rank very strongly. We, in the survey that I quote in here, we rank third in the world in terms of the quality of our universities, something that we don't think of very often. Our high school students are fourth, fifth, and sixth in science, math, and reading comprehension in the world. Our, we have companies like RIM who are world beaters. Look at Canadian literature. We, we have some of, the, some of the greatest writing there is these days is in Canada. Uh, if you look at the, at, the, at the intangibles for Canada, we're regarded as being a country that integrates foreigners better than anywhere else on earth and harnesses that diversity more effectively than anybody else on earth does. So we're, you know, we are a country that has enormous possibilities. And then, and, and then you look at the world that we have to cope with, and there you see uh, the stars forming in a very favorable way for Canada. We used to have, the scope for our diplomacy was from A to B. It was, you know, we lived in a two superpower world and, and that was basically the range. Then the Russians or the Soviets disappeared and we went to a one superpower world and the range for diplomacy was from A to A, basically. Now, we're, now we have a multi-centric world. One of the great tragedies for losing this Security Council round is that most of the contestants for permanent seats, the big countries, uh, are now on the Security Council. This would have been an ideal opportunity to advance our interests and to protect our interests because some of the reform they could make of the Security Council is not going to be in our interest. So we could have been there to kind of channel and, and, and guide that, and we didn't. But fundamentally, what, I'm, I, what I thought was that this is, a, you know, we're a country that really can play this game. And, and there's nothing stopping us but ourselves. Some people say that we've become world class in complacency. Uh, I, I, I think that there's a danger of that. I don't think it necessarily has to happen. I also thought that Canadians were interested in foreign policy. One of the great myths in this country is that nobody is interested. You know, who's interested in foreign policy? No election ever turns on foreign policy. Uh, it's true that no election so far has turned on foreign policy. But my prediction is that when people form their judgment of Mr. Harper as a leader, foreign policy is going to be part of what they, uh, part of what they think about. Uh, Canadians like to see their leaders being effective on the world stage. And if, when they're not effective, when they, when they are repudiated as they have been this time, I think there are likely to be consequences from that. 
I may be wrong. I may be, you know, I may be too far into this uh, business to, to see clearly about it. But I think Canadians really want, we used to get, be told that you know, Canadians are interested in foreign policy, but it's American foreign policy they're interested in. They're not in, interested in Canadian foreign policy. I don't think that's true anymore. When I, since I left working uh, in the government, I, you know, I've, I've, I've made an, an accidental career out of being a commentator. People keep asking me, you know, why is this happening? And what's going on? What does this really mean? What's the backstory? of these kinds of things. I think people are interested. So I thought, well, why not write a book for people who are interested but not in the, you know, don't spend their lives every day in the foreign policy business. You know, something that doesn't get so far into the weeds that you get lost. But on the other hand is, you know, gives a pretty accurate, I hope, picture of the way things work. Well, one of the great things about the book, in my view, is that you start with history and context before mm -hmm. you get into foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So you talk a little bit about the days when you think we did play the game well. Right. Mm -hmm. So who has been particularly effective, in your view, as prime minister, in delivering a foreign policy that you admire? Well, there, there's, there are two people who you could say were the best, uh, and both will surprise you. One could be Louis Saint Laurent. Because, it, because he had Pearson as his foreign minister. Mm -hmm. and, and Canada was, you, know, you can find Canadian fingerprints on the UN Charter, on the, on the World Trade, what's now the World Trade Organization, it used to be the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, on the Bretton Woods Institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. It was, we went from a period when Mackenzie King had been prime minister, when he did not want to get involved in anything Maybe you've all seen the picture of Mackenzie King sitting between Churchill and Roosevelt at Quebec City in the Second World War. That was the extent of his participation in the event. They took the pictures, they took the chairs away, Roosevelt and Churchill went into a room to do their business, and, and Mackenzie King disappeared from the scene. Uh, and Canadian people thought that he was somehow involved. He wasn't involved. There were two conferences in Quebec in, 43 and 44, our, our military wasn't even welcome to participate in the military discussions on issues that were of direct consequence to them. And the problem was not Churchill, although I'm not sure how strong an advocate he was. The problem was Roosevelt. Roosevelt didn't, he said, well, if we invite Canada, we have to invite Brazil, and we have to invite Argentina, and we have to invite this country and that country. If the Canadians insist on participating in these meetings in Quebec, then let's have them in Bermuda, and then we don't have to have the Canadians there. That is, that is about the only uh, graphic I have in the book, because it is so stark how little regarded we were. We had a million five hundred thousand soldiers in the end of the war in Europe. We protected the North Atlantic. We flew the, we flew the bomber runs uh, with uh, Bomber Harris, uh, not necessarily always to our credit. Uh, we, played, we, put, we spent billions, we trained the Commonwealth Air Corps, and we got zero uh, credit for doing all of that. If you think we don't get credit for Afghanistan, you can imagine. We had more people die on the beach in, 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 at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Juneau Beach in, in Normandy in the first 10 minutes, probably, than we've had die in, in Afghanistan. We made enormous sacrifices. And our diplomacy at the time was not up to it. We did not get the credit, partly because we were not, our diplomacy was inadequate. So Saint Laurent was one. Who's Saint Laurent was one, because what I wanted, the point I wanted to make was, it was a dramatic change. All of a sudden, all of this was gone. All of the reticence was gone. And now we had an activist foreign minister, given his head by a, by a wise prime minister. We had very strong foreign service. And they basically ch helped to change the world. And that's from a standing start in about 1944. It's really, it's really amazing. The other one will also surprise you, but it, you know, if, you, if you remember who I worked for, it might not surprise you that much. Uh, I think that Brian Mulroney was the second most effective. In fact, as prime minister, probably the most effective uh, in carrying out foreign policy. Just to put it in perspective, and, and there are reasons for it, but to put it in perspective, by this time in his time in office, Mulroney already had a free trade agreement with the United States. He had an acid rain agreement with the United States. He had an Arctic passage agreement with the United States. He was leading the fight in the UN on apartheid and sanctions against the British and the Americans, by the way. He, was, uh, he had, uh, together with, uh, with uh, uh, 
Stephen Lewis, uh, my predecessor several times removed in New York, they had been the first country to react to the Ethiopian famine. Brian Stewart was doing the reporting for CBC, and Canada was the first to, to react at the UN in trying to respond to that. If you go to, uh, if, you, if you look in the, in the book, you'll see a place where uh, Helmut Kohl gives credit to three people for the unification of Germany. Uh, I didn't think that was such a... That was an excellent <laughs> point. <laughs> Helmut, Helmut Kohl uh, gave a speech uh, at the time in which he said there are three countries, three people he has to thank for the unification of Germany. George Bush, uh, Michael, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and Brian Mulroney. What people don't know, and it's, it's practically unknown at the time, is that the British and the French especially, and the Russians as well, were dead against German reunification. They said, we've seen this movie before, it ends badly. We like the Germans divided. It suits us. Every, you know, we, we can have two Germans, and, and that's a lot better than having two smaller Germans, a lot better than having one big one. Uh, and Mulroney, and I, I was there for this comment. He said, look, we have made promises to the German people since the mid-50s that when the time came, they would be reunited. Well, the time has come. And the Germans understand this as a promise of the West, and if we don't do it, uh, there's going to be great disappointment in Germany. And it doesn't take a genius to think that disappointing the German people greatly on something is a bad idea. So, <laughs> <laughs> so is that so, effectiveness, then, a yeah. function of exceptional individuals who take initiative? Is it, a, is it a question of a certain constellation of factors that came together at that moment to allow those successes to occur? What is it that we can take from those two effective cases that we can replicate, or can we? Uh, there's, there's, there's one thing you can take. There's two things you can take uh, out of it, I think. The first thing is personal diplomacy led by the prime minister is vital. That's where, in this day and age, uh, the prime minister has to lead foreign policy. He has to be the person who's leading it. He has to be the person who's thinking about it. He has to be the person who goes to all of the summits, who meets bilaterally, and so on. The second thing is, uh, relating to this, the prime ministerial point, is you've got to be very active. This is not something that's a sideline. It's not something that you, you do when you have time, you know, something for, uh, for the weekend if you've got nothing better to do. Most of a prime minister's time, when I was in the, in the, in the PCO and it's on, in the PMO also, and it's only become worse, most of the prime minister's time is on foreign affairs. It, it, you know, they, none of them comes to office prepared, and that's your fault, basically. You vote for people who haven't got a clue about international relations when they come to office. And Mr. Harper hadn't been off the continent when he came to office. Imagine. He hadn't, he, he, half of his time is going to be on foreign relations, and he had zero experience in foreign relations. You know, so that, that's the second thing you can take from it. And this is something that Brian Mulroney said about, uh, well, he said it in February. There was a conference on uh, remembering the a conference that was called the Open Skies Conference that was held in Ottawa in, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I guess, whatever that would make it, uh, that would make it 1990. And this was to bring, and, but at this conference, which was held for a different purpose, there was the German foreign minister, the Russian foreign minister, the British foreign minister, the American secretary of state, the Canadian foreign minister, and, and Germany was in ferment at that time. And they got together, and they got the Germans and, the, and the, the two German foreign ministers, and they had a session in which they kind of plotted out how German unification would happen. Uh, so that, that was serendipitous. But as Mulroney said, everything that he did, all of the achievements that he has in foreign relations, came up to him largely through the bureaucracy. People think of bureaucracies as being staid places where people don't think and they're waiting for people like us think tanks. We think tanks to tell them what to do. And if only we would tell them what to do then they, and they did it, they'd be better off. In fact, there are a lot of very high quality public servants, uh, as, as good as ever. And if you can stimulate them, if you can encourage them, if you can inspire them, if you can engage them and give them some room to maneuver, they can do, they can do terrific things for you. Part of the problem we have these days is that the public service is basically in a, in a state of opposition 
to the government. The government doesn't want to hear from them, doesn't want to take their advice on foreign policy, God knows, uh, and generally tr tries to, to, you know, takes a, takes a view that it knows what it's doing and it doesn't need much help. Well, we've seen how that works out. If you want to contrast uh, the, the current uh, record with the Mulroney record, I think you'll see right down the line that there's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. Mulroney participated in every single UN peacekeeping mission. Every, people think that he was too close to the United States. That closeness is what helped get us those agreements. He, uh, the second thing that you should know about him is that he was a, probably as, as strong a backer of the UN as anybody other than Pearson, perhaps. We paid our, he used to tell me, and I have, used to have to do this, I had to get a UN official and, a, and a, somebody from our mission in New York so that on the first day of January every year, we paid our dues in full, on time, day one. That's what he wanted. You know, I would have been happy if it had been day two. You know? <laughs> but he wanted it on the first day. It was a sign of how committed <coughs> to the UN he was. We participated in every single UN peacekeeping mission up to, until that point. The world's changed a bit, undoubtedly. But we haven't participated seriously in a peacekeeping mission, a blue helmet mission, in over a decade. So if you wonder why people begin to think that we have kind of withdrawn uh, from the scene, I mean, we have withdrawn. We're not participating. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because we haven't withdrawn as a financial contributor. Must our contribution be to peacekeeping missions, or can it take another form and still be legitimate? Can we be the rich guy who gives the money and lets other people do the dirty work? Is that the essential question? That's one question? way to spin it, but another way to spin it is we're a rich country, we'll finance the operations, and others who can't necessarily finance them will contribute in the way that they're able. Yeah. Of the G20 countries, counting, even counting our contribution to Afghanistan, we rank 15th out of the G20 in terms of military contribution into international operations. 15th. You know, I, re I remember the day when I was in New York, we always, I, I'd ask Canadians, how, you know, where do we rank on peacekeeping? Well, I don't know, probably not as high as we used to, maybe third. Well, at the time we were 36, now we're 49th. So we are, you know, other countries, other big countries, other rich countries, starting with the United States, feel a responsibility for international relations and put their assets on the line. Uh, I think it would be unworthy of us to say, this is a job for the Pakistanis to do. We'll provide the money, they provide the bodies, uh, and if people get uh, chopped up, well, at least they're not Canadians. I think we have a civic duty to try to make the system work better, and I don't think that we're living up to it. Is it fair to say that we're not living up to it at this moment because we don't have a defense uh, policy and uh, military that can actually be active in multiple locations simultaneously? Or wh is what you're suggesting an expansion of our defense capacity so as to meet that obligation in addition to whatever obligations we may perceive in places like, like Afghanistan? Yeah, and, and, and maybe a bit of a, uh, of a reprioritization. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about, I'm not against the mission of, in Afghanistan. In fact, I'm, I'm, I, I was one of the people who was in favor of it. And if, People don't like that. That's something to take into account. I don't think it should deter you from buying the book, but uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, on Afghanistan, we got into Afghanistan for, for two reasons. One was it was a legal war. The United States had been attacked by Al-Qaeda. They had asked the Taliban to turn over Al-Qaeda. Taliban had refused. The US went to the Security Council and got authorization to use military action against uh, against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. We had 24 people killed in that attack on the World Trade Center. Our closest ally had been attacked out of the blue. Uh, and uh, I thought we had a responsibility. Moreover, uh, and we reacted pretty much right away. We had Canadian troops there right at the beginning. Uh, I remember we, the shock on, uh, in the Canadian newspapers when they saw that, when they could see the Maple Leaf patch on some guys who looked like they weren't Blue Helmet volunteers, but actual combat soldiers who had captured some Taliban and were dealing with them somehow, turning them over. Another chapter to be continued, by the way. Uh, anyway, uh, the second reason is that the Iraq war uh, was breaking out. And it was better, in my judgment, to be part of a legal war recognized by the UN uh, 
basically sanctioned by the UN, and allow ourselves to be dragged in what was going to be an illegal war that was going to finish badly without any question. Uh, I have a chapter in the book about, um, about the Iraq story, uh, and um, uh, I'm getting rather far from your question, which is, uh, do we need a larger military? I think we did lead. I think what the, started by Paul Martin, carried on strongly by Stephen Harper, I think we do need that military. I don't know if we need to buy F-35 aircraft on, on, a single, uh, on a single source contract, you know, without competition. I don't think that's a terrific idea, usually. But I have no doubt that we need military capability. Sometimes I think we need more ground forces capability and a little less of the other kind. Uh, and that would allow us to do more things. We're now in a situation, I think, in Afghanistan where we pretty much have used our people flat out. And I don't think that we're, you know, I think they need a break of a year or so. People have gone back on their second and third tours and, and uh, you know, it's dangerous stuff. But I think that, you know, there is, at the same time, there is, there grew up in our military service the notion that real men don't do peacekeeping. This, this was sort of the muscular stuff that was coming out of the U.S. during the neocon age in the Bush administration. Tough guys don't do peacekeeping. Tough guys don't do nation building. I remember very clearly Bush saying, you know, we don't do nation building. We don't, and, and uh, Condi Rice saying, we don't escort uh, school kids. You know, we're, we're here to kick ass. If, I don't know if that goes over on television, but anyway. Um, so, our people were training and they absorbed some of this stuff. There is a kind of bias against the UN in our, in our, among our military. When I was in uh, New York, we were asked several times to contribute something to a military regime. And the answer always came back that they didn't want to do it, and, you know, didn't want to do Africa, didn't want to, didn't want to become involved. It, uh, I, didn't, I wouldn't say that we didn't actually do anything. We did some things, we did some things very well, but it was not with the same commitment and not to the same extent. Uh, and there are strategic, you know, there are good tactical reasons for wanting to be co a part of a coalition of the willing. There are people that you know, you're inter the, the equipment is interoperable, you can work with each other easily, you can end up, uh, you know, if you, get, if you get hurt, you've got this great medical care that's open to you. Uh, and that may not be the case, uh, or as much the case uh, with the UN, but there are strategic reasons for doing it with the UN that don't exist in, 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 in American-led especially, uh, uh, coalitions of the wilding. You know, there's a legitimacy with a UN mandate that you don't get otherwise. Uh, and, uh, you know, just think of how the Americans and those who supported them have, have you know, the, the, the problems that they've gone through because the UN, UN would not endorse their mission in, in Iraq. It cost them a vast amount more money many more people, uh, and countries, uh, countries came out of it with a pretty, in some cases, pretty poor reputations. So you don't get those downsides when, it's, when you have a UN mandate. The UN itself, I, you know, if, if you read this, you'll see that I don't, uh, I don't sugarcoat the UN's problems. The UN really does have problems. But the UN is better than most people will give it credit for being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why did we lose the seat? We lost the seat for two reasons. One was a general, added, a general withdrawal from the world, no more peacekeeping, not observing our Kyoto commitments, shutting down or, or closing down or, or, or very largely cutting back our diplomacy abroad. Uh, in the middle of the year last year, we, um, uh, an order went out from Ottawa that no more money should be spent on travel and hospitality for the rest of the year in most missions. This is, these are force multipliers for diplomats. You've got to be able to travel and see, see your territory. I, I, you know, I was one of the, I, was, I think I was the first Canadian ambassador to travel extensively in East Germany after the wall came down. You know, if I hadn't had a budget, how would I have, how would I have been doing that? The other thing that people don't understand about representation allowances, which, which elicit a lot of jealousy because it's money to spend to eat and drink, uh, is that a, a diplomat has a very short period of time to get to know people. You don't spend a lifetime in Germany. I don't, didn't spend a lifetime in Ankara. I had two or three or four years. I had to f get to know people. I had to build relationships. 
I had to, I had to be plugged in so that when something came along, I was ready. Something came along in this particular case, the, 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 UN, uh, the, the UN defeat, and it was, it was too late. We had already run down our relationships with a, with a lot of people. The second thing, and, uh, and I don't think this is controversial, although it, uh, you know, there will be people who don't like it, uh, we, we, we carried out a kind of ineffectual diplomacy. And we carried out a diplomacy that actually created uh, opposition rather than support. You know, it took us four years to figure out how important the Chinese were. It took about the same amount of time to figure out how important the Indians were. In the summer of 2009, we imposed, we imposed visas on the Mexicans because there were a small number of people presenting themselves as refugees who weren't refugees. We did it from one day to the next. We had nobody in place to hand out visas to the 250,000 Mexicans who were going to come to Canada. Can you imagine? Now they all show up at the embassy to get visas? And there's, you know, how is that going to work? Uh, the Canadian travel industry lost hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the foreign minister was meeting the next day or the day after something in a very short period of time with a Mexican foreign minister. Didn't know this was, apparently didn't know or didn't realize what kind of bad news this was going to be. The prime minister had to go to, went to Mexico for a trial, had to apologize for the way we handled it. You know, this is, this kind of stuff doesn't make you friends. This, you know, all you need to know about diplomacy you learned in kindergarten. Uh, and uh, we, you know, for whatever reason, uh, we, we, we don't seem to be good at relationships. Then there were the policies, you know. You tell the world you don't care about climate change. You know, the, the liberals didn't implement it. Uh, the conservatives basically rejected almost, you know, there's still some doubt in my mind whether they believe there is such a thing as climate change. Um, and if you're a small island state in the Pacific and you have a vote uh, as, you know, uh, there's 20 or 30 small island uh, countries, uh, you, have, you have a vote just like China does. And if the country that you're asking you to vote for them doesn't care, it seems insensitive to your interests of cl on climate change, well, that doesn't, that's not a sales point. Uh, if you're an African country and you're worrying about the spread of the desert and the country that's responsible for a significant part of the, of the problem says that it's not going to do anything until the United States does something, and then until, until China does something, until everybody else does something. Otherwise, why should we do it? It doesn't make any difference. Well, the impression you create is that you don't care very much about their problem, which you're helping to create. They're not the ones who created it. Climate change is, you know, the, the, uh, the greenhouse gases are cumulative in the in environment. This started it with, in the, from, by the West with the Industrial Revolution, practically. And certainly the last 50 or 60 years, the vast majority of the greenhouse gases that are trapped up there came from the West. They didn't come from China and India, and certainly not from, you know, Senegal or, or, uh, or, or uh, Micronesia. So we left the impression that we weren't very interested in their issues. Uh, we weren't very interested in international relations. Uh, in my time in this business, I think it's true to say that President Reagan went to the UN every fall and participated in the general debate. President George H.W. Bush went to the UN every fall uh, for four years and participated in the debate. President Clinton went eight years in a row to the UN and participated in the debate. George W. Bush went eight years in a row and participated in the debate. Some of our prime ministers haven't thought it was worth doing. So what do these Americans know that we don't know? Or what do we know that they don't know? Maybe that would be a better way of asking that question. So we, we left the impression, I think, that we didn't, we didn't want it enough. We didn't, I'm, our delegation on the ground was working its, its tail off. And the people in Ottawa, the, 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 the officials who were leading the effort, were working extremely hard. I, I know the ambassador personally. He's a friend of mine. I could tell by the look on his face on television when this was going on, that we, were, we didn't have it in the bag. Nobody looks that worried who's, who's got some confidence about the way it was going to turn out. Um, then there are our policies. The policies we followed on climate change is one. On Africa, we decided you know, that we would have a, we know, going to have a focused foreign policy. We're going to concentrate our aid, and, and we're going to shift it from Africa 
to Latin America. Well, the Latin Americans, I think, are basically still waiting to see the benefits of that, and with the exception of Haiti. But in Africa, it was regarded as a downgrading. We were downgrading them publicly. We were saying, you don't matter as much as they matter to us. And this is after 50 years of building a relationship. So guess what? They didn't like it. How could that be? Why don't they understand? So what is the consequence for us? You know there's that there one, are there's, lots there's of people... An, there's another big one. There's another big one? There's another Tell big Tell us one. another reason. The Middle East. We align, progressively aligned our policies with the government of Israel more and more tightly. We got into a position where we didn't criticize the Israelis. We forgot about, uh, we forgot about international law, international humanitarian law. We didn't take seriously the rights and the suffering of the Palestinians. We used to have a reputation for being fair-minded. We have always, from day one, been a supporter of Israel. So we, we've always taken the view that Israel should, be a, you know, should, should, should exist uh, and in security and had a right to defend itself. Always. That's never, that we, ha we have never varied from that position from the beginning. But somewhere along the way, we, we got into the, we started to think of the Israelis as allies. Prime Minister Harper called them allies. There is no such treaty, by the way, that I'm aware of. Anyway, there might be a secret treaty somewhere. And we began to, we began to suspend judgment, I think. You know, we were uh, uh, trying to think of the, we were inclined to think, first of all, and there are Canadians on the other side of this argument who are all, who are also uh, a part of the problem, and I'll come to that in a moment. We began to think that the Israelis, uh, it was sort of our ally right or wrong. And then, it, and then it became our ally can do no wrong. And we began not to you know, exercise the critical judgment that we should have exercised. The, the security wall, the barrier, if the Israelis want to build a security wall along the border, who could, who could object? But if you want to build it in the, in the West Bank on Palestinian territory, what do you think they're going to think about that? If, if somebody builds a fence against, on your property, you know, takes five feet of your property, what would be the, what would be the reaction in, in, in Waterloo? People would be outraged. This neighbor has just built a fence on my property. You can't do that. Well, we didn't, we didn't seem to be able to transfer that kind of common sense wisdom to the policy issues. And we, we began to be seen as committed, aligned, and, uh, and, and not exercising the fair judgment that we had exercised in the past. And we had done it in the past. There are plenty of times when we had criticized the Palestinians. I think the proper policy that we should be following is, is you know, we should base our positions on international law and international humanitarian law, and we should leaven them with some compassion for people on both sides who are having a pretty tough time. But we should not try to say, one side's a democracy, and therefore we're on that side. One side's not a democracy, we're not on that side. That side's always wrong, the democracy is always right. The United States, the world's greatest democracy by its own admission, is a country that, that uh, uh, what's it, rendered, if that's a strange term, rendered Canadians to Syria to be tortured. Democracy did it. Is that okay with us? Did, did Canadians say, oh, well, it was, of course, it, they were, it, the United States is a democracy, and so it wouldn't make a mistake, and it wouldn't violate a human right. It can, it can have a prison camp in, in Guantanamo. It can, it can carry out what it, the torture it did at, at, uh, at the airfield in, uh, or at, at Bagram. Was it Bagram? No, it, anyway, the one in, Af in, in Iraq, I've forgotten the name. So we became... Uh, and, and so let's add, up the, let's add up the vote total. Small island states, plus or minus 20. African states, 53. Arab and, and, uh, and uh, Muslim states, 57. You need to get 128 seats out of 192 to win. Mm -hmm. where, are they gonna, where are the votes going to come from? How are you going to get that far? So and you want to you ask me about the UN and what a bunch of tyrants it is? Is this the point? <laughs> well, I, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit yeah, because okay. I, I do want to 
No, I mean, obviously, it's, yeah. it's hard to quibble with what you're suggesting, that we should have a foreign policy that adheres to international law. Of course we should. Made in Canada. Made in Canada, which is easier said than done. Does that mean that public opinion drops out of the mix? Does that mean that the so-called principles of a particular party or leader drop out of the mix? You know, you know that better than anybody, because you're answering a lot of this this week, that a lot of people are saying today, so what? No. So what we lost the seat? We are making certain choices as Canadians, and we support them, and if people around the world don't like it, so be it. Well, they don't say that. They say we're being You're principled. You're not reading the National Post. No, they say that we're being principled. We're following a principled foreign policy. The party, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Principled foreign policy. Okay. Is it principled to ignore international law? But even, you know, even can, citizens... I mean, how can we... How can we con we, we, there's, a, there's a conceit here on the part of Canadians which is really quite stunning. We think that we're in charge of principles and moral behavior, and we are the arbiters, and everybody else is wrong. You know? How could you vote for those Europeans, you know? Well, they actually have quite a strong human rights record, especially the Germans, recently. <laughs> you know, there was a time when they, you know, no one would be saying that. But they do have. We, we present ourselves as superior. We're going to take our marbles and go home. Why should we get along with these? You know, how many dictators? In the, the UN is run by dictators, right? You know that there's 116 electoral democracies in the UN out of 192? That Freedom House says 150 out of 192 countries are free or largely free? This isn't the collection of dictatorships. We have to start waking up a little bit and seeing the world as it is, not as we would like to imagine it to be. The idea that we're the ones who have, the, who have a monopoly on principle, it, you know, when they see us paying no attention to where a wall is being built, when they see us paying no attention to the settlements being built on somebody else's territory, when they see us going along on, on, the, on the annexation of East Jerusalem, and we say we're principled, Really? Why, did, why should, in, in what respect does that make us more principled than the people who are more prepared to recognize international law are? The, the, the fundamental end of the story is we presented ourselves and the international community didn't like what it saw and it rejected us. And it's not a bunch of, of, uh, of uh, tyrants and dictatorships and, and human rights abusers. On the contrary. And the UN, by the way, has played a major role in the democratization of, 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 all, of a lot of countries. So if you think about you know, the idea that the UN isn't worth it, you know, the UN gave, gave shelter last year to a population the size of Canada. The UN fed last year over 100 million people. The UN has 100,000 soldiers in the field. The UN set up an international criminal court system that didn't exist anymore. The Climate Change Treaty and all the other international treaties are happening under UN auspices. So we should take our marbles and go home back to Canada and go home and live in this vast north and pay no attention to what's going on in the world. And the other thing is the world is changing. We're not in charge of the world. The United States is not in charge of the world. It's not in charge of the UN. We live in a multipolar world and it's time we really realize it. Other people have views, and those views are, have validity. Not always as much as every, each one is the other, but there, there's, there's, it does you no good taking the view that this is a place you can walk away from. You've got the choice. The UN Charter is the central operating system of international law. It's the, it's the, um, it's, it's the rule book for international relations. We, we Canada. How, how would we fare at 35 million people with a vast amount of resources at our disposal and an army not big enough to defend us in a situation in which there were no rules? Is that the, world, the kind of world that we would rather live in, where it was everybody against everybody else? How long do you think, uh, how, how good would life look to us in those circumstances? We need the rules, we need the UN, we need the charter. And uh, we need to contribute to that. If we don't think it's working well, then who can say it's working well in a place like Sudan? I see Caroline there who can, who, who can tell me more about the, the Sudan and, and the failures of, of the UN uh, and other organizations than anybody else in the room can, probably. Yes, there are failures. Yes, there are weaknesses. But, you know, uh, it, uh, you have two choices. You can get involved and try to make it better, 
or you can sit on the sidelines and, and criticize. And sitting on the sidelines and criticize, you know, which is to some extent what I've been getting at and getting back in the game, doesn't really do you any good. Let me ask you one more question and, and then we'll throw it open. So maybe while we're starting, we're chatting about this, people can start to step to the microphone uh, if they have questions for, for Mr. Heinbecker. Canada-US relations. You suggest in the book that we should have an independent foreign policy, right. but we should also be mindful of Absolutely. the interests of the United States. How do you reconcile those two? Well, you know, the United States isn't always wrong. That's the first thing to bear in mind. Uh, you know, I also say in the book something like, uh, we shouldn't shrink from agreeing with them when they're right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't shrink from disagreeing with them when they're wrong. They were wrong on Iraq, uh, and, uh, and we disagreed with them. I think that, that, that's, all, you know, that's normal. I think that the, the, the key to good relations with Washington is the following. If we have an effective foreign policy in the world, the United States is, is the dominant country in the world and it will remain preeminent for a long time to come. If we have an effective foreign policy in the world, they, you know, they're going to welcome that. That's not a negative from an American point of view. That's a positive. The more effective we are, the more they're going to listen to us, the more, that we, the more valuable we become to them. And conversely, the more effective we are, in, uh, we are in Washington, the more the world is going to listen to us. So there's a kind of virtuous circle there. And, it's, and if, if you have an effective foreign policy and you have a good relationship with the Americans, those things go hand in hand. They're not, they're not, they're not uh, alternatives. In those circumstances, uh, you know, we, we, can, uh, we can run a very effective relationship with Washington. We don't have to be in a state of conflict with Washington. We've gone through eight years of George W. Bush. That was a particular time. We didn't have that kind of negative relationship with Clinton or George H.W. Bush, and we're not having it now, I don't think, at least we don't have to have it, with Barack Obama. So, you know, we, we had a bad period. It made sense to disagree with, strongly with that particular administration on a lot of what it was doing, but now, you know, that now it's time to sort of get on with it, and, and uh, you know, and it, it's evidently an administration that could use some help. Mm. Let's get on with it then. Uh, hi, my name is Tanil, and I was just wondering, when you look at the UN at the moment, is there any country that you would consider is a model global citizen at the moment? I guess you'd probably... I, I would have said Canada uh, until the, the evidence came in that I can't say Canada anymore. <laughs> the rest of the Membership doesn't believe it anyway. Um, Canada in the, in the 90s, Canada in Mulroney's time, Canada in Trudeau's time, Canada in Pearson's time. Uh, we, cert we were the model uh, of the UN. Now if you look, I, uh, the, the, re the, the reason I'm, this is becoming a complicated answer is because of the EU, and it kind of subsumes the foreign policy of so many countries that used to be considered sort of model citizens, like the Dutch, like the Swedes, uh, like the Danes. I guess if you, if you looked at, if I changed your question slightly, which is the most effective country in the UN? It would be Britain. The British are the most effective country. No one questions at, at, in New York their veto very much. They're, they're the people who write most of the resolutions. They're the people who do most of the diplomacy. They make themselves absolutely indispensable. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and in the process, as if by, by, by some miracle, they serve their own interests. But they do it in, in such a smooth way. Uh, if, I were, if I were emulating anybody, I, I'd emulate them. I'd probably emulate Norway. Norway is, uh, an, an, you know, is a fifth or a sixth the size of Canada maybe seventh or eighth the size of Canada, it has an enormous impact in the world. Nor Norway is, a, it, because it's rich, because it invests in its foreign policy a lot of money, they're able to do a lot of things like they did, the, you know, it's getting to be a bit dated now, but they, they're the ones who brought us the Oslo Accord. They were active in, in Sri Lanka and they're active in other places that we don't even know about. So th that would be a model country. Uh, Perhaps Australia would qualify these days. I don't know where you're from. I hear a little bit of it. <laughs> I thought that might be the case. Uh, the Australians are playing a very strong role. 
Uh, I think in the, in the time of Mr. Howard, they were not, uh, uh, but I think they are now. Hello, Ambassador. Uh, as you're aware, I'm a former military Indeed. officer. Um, spent most of my career abroad um, teaching now at Laurier. One of the questions I asked my students today uh, was what reasons they gave uh, for Canada not, uh, not getting the Security Council seat. And I was uh, pleased to see that the students identified multiple reasons for why that uh, may not have happened. And, and in fact, you've echoed that same thing and, and not looked at it simply from uh, a one-dimensional perspective. So I certainly, uh, certainly applaud that. In my career abroad, one of the things I was absolutely stunned by was the lack of, for, for a better word, manpower that our diplomatic forces abroad have and, and the lack of uh, funding to support uh, some of these missions ab abroad. I'm not sure if you comment on this at length in your book or whether you'd care to comment on it today, but what, in your opinion, uh, is required in terms of additional funding and personnel uh, to bring back our diplomatic core uh, to a higher standard. Yeah, I, uh, I even try to make it work it out mathematically. I'm not quite sure of the numbers now. I think it's 27, 20, 20 to 7 to 3 in terms of proportion. I don't, uh, I don't begrudge the military its increase in, in, in capability. I think that we had uh, for years uh, scrimped when it came to the military and we asked them to do more and more things and they had less and less resources to do it with. There is always the gold-plated, you know, uh, some uh, Air Force general celebrating his retirement by flying around the world or something in, a, in an executive jet and giving people the impression that money was being wasted all over the place. But I've been on lots of military bases and they were, they were pretty threadbare looking operations. So I don't, I don't, I don't uh, begrudge that. What the problem, and, 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 I, and I, the problem is that you can't, he who has the gold rules, if you give all of the money to the military and, you're, and, you, and you basically cut back with the others, then you're going to end up with a militaristic foreign policy because those are the people who've got the resources to do it. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Department's budget uh, for, for, and this is a tricky business, and if, you know, you can, I, I invite you to look at the Treasury Board statistics if you really want to make yourself dizzy. You can't tell anything from year to year. You have to be able to get inside the numbers and find out what is being spent on core diplomacy. And on core diplomacy, it's been going down. It's been going down since uh, 2004. There was a period in the late 80s, early 90s, in the Mulroney period and the, and the, and the Kratom Martin period of uh, when Martin was finance minister up to 95, 96, when there were very significant budget cuts uh, for the whole of the government, including for diplomacy. That started again in 2004, and we're down $188 million a year. This is for people who, have, who basically are doing diplomacy. You can imagine the impact that makes. And when you, get, when you get an instruction while we're running for the UN Security Council to stop traveling and to stop uh, trying to cultivate relationships, at least spending money to cultivate relationships, then and you're really handicapping people. So that what needs to happen is that, yes, we need to spend the money on defense, I think that's right. Uh, I would ask somebody to tell me who the enemy is because I, I, I find the, I find the, uh, the, the I, I, I find the uh, sort of claims against the Soviets for flying in international waters, as a, you know, the, trying to justify the, the purchase of F-35s. I find that completely unconvincing. But nevertheless, you know. We are, we are going to need aircraft. The F-18s don't last, last forever. And we need other kinds of things as well. But we should have a proportion. Why don't we come up with a formula that says, broadly, this much for military, this much for foreign aid, and this much for diplomacy, because they all contribute to your national security. And you can make a very good argument. I make it. I don't know. Nobody can refute it, because it's, it's not based on any statistics. <laughs> That's the, the dollar spent on diplomacy is probably a bigger contribution to your, interna to your national security than a dollar spent on defense because it takes so many dollars in defense and a, and a dollar on diplomacy goes further. The, the, the marginal utility of it is higher. So if I had to, you know, if somebody asked me, and I, didn't, I presume I'm not going to be asked, uh, 
about this. But if somebody asked me, what would you do? Uh, I would start with reinvesting in diplomacy. The second thing I would do, I think, was I'd ask myself, what are we doing on foreign aid, really? We've, we've, uh, since Pearson, we have been committed to reaching 0.7% uh, percent of our, uh, in aid for our, uh, of our, of our, uh, of our budget. 0.7 of our GDP, excuse me, 0.7 percent. We've re, re, every government, every Canadian government has reiterated that commitment. None has come close to it. Under Trudeau and, and latterly Mulroney, we were at about 0.48 or 5 maybe at, at one point, and then it kind of just retreated back. We're back to 3, 3.3 percent. The Germans, you know, people have said to me, but we spend so much money on aid, why, you know, why is the world so ungrateful? Well, actually, the Germans spend a lot more money than we do on aid. And the Portuguese, who are an admittedly poor country, spend almost as much proportionately on foreign aid as we do. So we have, you know, we've now frozen our aid budget for the foreseeable future, which means that the proportion of our, you know, the aid we're given on a per capita basis, you know, which is the measurement used internationally for for the generosity of aid programs. That's just going to get smaller and smaller again. We're, we're in retreat. We're in retreat there. We're in retreat on, in the military in, in terms of operations. We're in retreat in diplomacy. And it shows. People see it. And they vote for other people. Okay, probably the last question. Uh, Dr. Heinberger, thank you uh, very much for a fascinating discussion. I've been to a number of uh, book launches in the past, but this has really been one of the best that I've attended. And uh, Patricia, terrific uh, moderation work there, so thanks to you as well. Two questions. Uh, you know, we, we've been talking about new diplomacy as well, and, we, and you mentioned uh, that uh, the world has changed. We are now into a kind of a multi-centric uh, world where the norms and the values and the behaviors are so different from what we were used to about two or three decades ago. So the question is that, uh, Dr. Heinbecker, what do you see the role or the characteristics of the new diplomat in a new diplomacy? You know, what, uh, what are some of the, the attributes that uh, are required from this new diplomat to be successful in the world that we are living in? Question number two, uh, the other thing that you mentioned earlier uh, when you started off the discussion was that the general public is really not engaged in foreign policy issues. How do you get the general public involved in foreign policy issues that, you know, some of the things that just ha happened uh, in the recent uh, UN situation and vis-a-vis -vis Canada, one would think that the, the decisions are really made in, in an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. So is there a way we can engage the larger mainstream, mainstream community in foreign affairs issues that we have some impact into what is being uh, decided at uh, the government level or at the, uh, at the high levels? Ah, the attributes, that's a difficult question. Uh, it's a question I should have anticipated for this kind of an audience. Obviously, if you're in a university town, people want to know what kind of graduates they should be <laughs> producing. Um, I don't think it's changed very much. I think the, 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 there's still a premium on thinking communi and communicating. I don't think that that changes very much over the years. I think we, you know, if, you've got to be able to understand what's happening. You've got to be able to report home what's happening. And you've got to be able to interact with local people so that you can get on with them. I don't think that's changed a lot. There are some things that have obviously changed. You know, when I went, to, when I was in the at the beginning, we used to send messages by telex and coded telex, and it was an enormously difficult thing. Now everybody's got the, the internet, and, and you know, communication is instantaneous. Everybody knows everything. The 24 news hour news cycle is making diplomacy very difficult as well, uh, because uh, I was um, I was head of the Kosovo task force. And we had a press briefing every day on the record, by the way, uh, unlike what has been happening on Afghanistan. But, you know, we never knew what, what was going to happen next. And uh, I remember one day uh, the, the Chinese embassy was bombed and there was an enormous outcry over that. Another time, 
a bus, uh, you know, a bridge was bombed, and just as the bomb got to the bridge, a bus came out of nowhere and got blown to smithereens, and you know, 20 or 30 people were killed. Uh, and we had to cope with those stories. The difficulty is, of course, the story is right there, right now, and it's all over the place. But you can't figure out what happened yet. If you're a responsible public servant, you're saying to yourself, well, I don't, you know, were they trying to hit that bus? Uh, you know, probably not. But, you know, what, what, was, what, was the, the, what were the orders? What was the rules of engagement? What, you know, what did they do? What happened? Did the, did the Serbs set, the, set it up? I mean, there are a million questions people would ask. The, the same thing with the Chinese embassy. You know. By the time we could figure out what the truth was, because we had to be the truth tellers, you know, the, the story, as someone said, uh, 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 by the time truth gets its pants on, falsehood is, is already traveled around the world. Uh, and that's, that is a very difficult thing. So, but to come back to your question about attributes, communications really matter. They really, uh, communications ability. Being able to think, being able to write, being able to speak, uh, that, you know, the rest of it is learnable, I think. Uh, maybe that's learnable too, I don't know. Uh, I guess that's worthy of another debate. Um, and what was, the second question was, the, um, I didn't write it down. Norm, how do you engage people in this moment? Well, it's a good question, and some of the people just engage themselves. I'm thinking again of Caroline, I see sitting there, Kubisarian, who joined Médecins Sans Frontières and, and other organizations. There are a lot of Canadians, uh, millions of Canadians, living abroad. Many of them are working for international organizations or NGOs abroad or have jobs with banks abroad or are doing something abroad. So there's a lot of people who are actually uh, interested in the world and involved in the world. There is a bit of a paradox about living in Canada because you know, if you, if you watched a, a, a debate before an election, you'd be forgiven for thinking that we lived in a, on a different planet than everybody else does. There's never a question on international relations. We, we put out some feelers here at, at CG before the last election, you know, to the parties and to the media. How about having a debate on foreign policy here in this room? You know, and, and we have, we'll have some discussion about foreign policy, you know. 50% of the Prime Minister's time is on foreign affairs questions. Maybe that's not a bad idea that we should find out what he thinks. Uh, and uh, to find out what all of the candidates think. There was no interest. There was no interest at all. Lloyd Axworthy did a pretty good job when he was foreign minister in bringing people along. That's how we got the landmines treaty and some of the other things that, uh, that we did get, by engaging the population. But it's not, it's, you know, I, I think in some senses, the population engages itself, and the government either uh, gets in front of that uh, parade or carries on in its own way. One thing I do want to say that even in, a, even in this multicentric world we're going into, we still live in a state-based system. It, there's, you know, the idea that, uh, that Bill Gates is going to run the world or, or, uh, or you know, anybody else is really not quite right. The, the power, there would not have been a landmines treaty had it not been for Lloyd X or the, and, and the backing of the Canadian government. It didn't matter how much other people wanted it. It took, it took one government, at least, to make it happen. So government will remain very important in the conduct of international relations. It will not have the field to itself, and, it, and for the most part, that's a good thing, as so long as you leave out the Cali cartel and the drug gangs and, and people like that. So it's a bit more crowded, but it's still going to be mainly the government that's running the international world, I think. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have two questions. My, my first question is, it's a political question. Do you think that this, uh, that Canada not getting this seat, is that going to be a wake-up call for this government? Or, or will we have to see a change of government to see um, efforts being made at the political level to stop this retreat in our foreign policy. So what is your reading of this government and what do you think, predict, will be the reactions um, to this going forward? My, my second question is more of a UN question. Uh, what, is, what do you believe is the likelihood that we will see some meaningful reform of the Security Council and, and, and the UN system in general going yeah. forward? We've seen, we've been talking about reform for a long time. 
although I agree with you entirely, it's a, it's a vital institution, it's underappreciated, but it's also not working and broken in certain respects. Uh, so what do you see um, as the likelihood that we are going to see some reform going ahead? Okay. Well, on the first question, I, I, of course, I don't know. Uh, one hopes that the government will say this is a wake-up call, um, that, um, that uh, obviously what we've been selling other people are not buying, and maybe we need to rethink our policies. I'm not saying that we should throw out our principles. I would like us to recognize that we're not the only ones who have principles, and some of what we present as principles may actually be self-interest. Uh, but I think that, you know, we should take a hard look at our policies again. We should hard, take a hard look at our diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy, I have no question. We should be investing in diplomacy. This is just, you know, the world is changing, and that's the direction things are going. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a minimum, we have, to have a, we have to have a diplomacy that's able to work with the NGOs and the business community and everybody else who's, who's uh, uh, active in international relations. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in the political, I'm not, I'm not a politician. Uh, I have my opinions like everybody else does. I would hope that the government uh, would be able to sort of say, let the dust settle and ever, let everybody get over it a bit, and then start to think about you know, what, went wrong, what went wrong and what should we be doing about it. That would be the rational reaction, I think, and, uh, and that, would be, that would be a healthy reaction. On, on the UN, you know, one man's reform is another man's uh, um, mistake sometimes. We're talking about the UN Security Council, which is the most effective body in the UN. There's, there's a lot of misunderstanding. The, the Security Council is not the cabinet of the UN. Security Council is an entity unto itself in the UN. It's the entity that the international community has said is responsible for international peace and security. It doesn't report to the Secretary General. Secretary General is like the steward of a club. He's not running that place. He's running the, he's running the logistics of it. You know, making sure the lights are on and the, you know, the heat's on in the wintertime. And he has a kind of a bully pulpit he can use, but he doesn't have the power to command forces at all. The place where the power resides to make things happen is in the Security Council. All the Secretary General can do is commend. He's a bit like a, a, a very high, high, uh, I'm thinking about, high ranking deputy minister in, in a way. The General Assembly also is not, is not the parliament. The General Assembly, there's not a single person elected, directly elected by people in that General Assembly. So just some of the facts. Security Council, uh, there are two particular qualities about the Security Council. One is the permanent membership of five countries, and the other is the veto that's been given to those five countries. There would not be a UN and there would not have been a Security Council had there not been for the veto. Uh, the big countries just simply would not have put themselves in a position where they could be outvoted on a matter of peace and war. It's just not going to happen. It wasn't going to happen then, isn't going to happen now. The difficulty is that that reflects more or less the uh, power structure, of course, of 1945. It doesn't re re reflect it exactly because if it did, Canada would have a permanent seat and France wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. we, were a, we were in a lot stronger position than they were at the end of Anyway, it worked out that way. So now we come along, we have India, we have, we have, uh, we have Brazil, we have uh, Japan and Germany. Japan giving 18, 19% of the entire budget of the UN, Germany about 9% of the budget. And then we have the powerful countries, the emerging powerful economies of, uh, of India and Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria. And they're saying, you know, that was 1945. You know, this is 65 years later. This is 2010. I hope that's 65. And uh, the, it's, it's time people took account of our interests and our policy and that the world has changed and the Security Council should change with it. And we should get, they say, a permanent seat and a veto. There is almost nothing I can think of that's more manifestly against Canadian interests than that outcome. Having five permanent members is already a big problem. Having five vetoes is a big problem. Having 10 vetoes is 10 times the big problem. So let us, you know, and one of the tragedies, one of the things that actually I'm worrying about by this loss, if you're, if you're wondering what we, we might have lost 
in this case. On the Security Council this time are going to be most of the emerging countries. If there's ever going to be a time when they can, and, and they're also, oh, by the way, all in the G20, uh, if there ever was a time when they could get together and start to cook an outcome of permanent seats for some of them, this is the time. And this was the time because from a Canadian point of view, A, we don't get one of those seats. B, it, they're not accountable. We don't need an organization in which more people are not accountable to the membership. You know, they just, once you get a permanent seat, you know, you've got a seat permanently, especially, and that's why they have the veto, to make sure it stays. You can't, because you can't overcome the veto. So if, they, if people get permanent seats, you know, the, the whole notion of democratic participation, of accountability, all of that goes out the window, and all we're seeing is the big countries kind of protecting their own interests. You saw how that might work at Copenhagen, where the five got together, the United States, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, I think. They reached a deal, five of them, four of the five at least, were the, uh, the major carbon emitters in the world, and they reached a deal that suited themselves, and they put it on the table and they said, take it or leave it. That's the kind of world that we could end up with if, if we reform the Security Council in a way that doesn't that, that isn't sensitive to, the, to this kind of an outcome. What I've recommended in the book is that we, we get into the, we, we start, we say to ourselves, all right, the world has changed. India, uh, Brazil, China, or Japan, uh, Germany, they have a point. We need to reflect this change some way. But the way to reflect the change is by electing them. And maybe we're a little less in favor of elections today than we were a couple weeks ago, but nonetheless. <laughs> You, they, let them stand for election. Make it a five-year term. Make it a ten-year term, even. But let them stand for elections. Let them run consecutively if they want to, each time. If the membership still thinks that they deserve to get elected, it'll, it'll elect them. And if, but, you know, if the world changes, and it's changed a lot since uh, 1945, and in another 50 years if it changes again as much as that, you know, you won't at least then be saying, well, oh, that record, you know, that reflects the world of 2010, but now everything has changed and we're stuck with these permanent members. So there is a way out of this, and that is to give them the opportunity to run for election for an extended period of time, and then they will, they will have their specialness recognized, their power recognized, but it won't be an anchor on the system for the rest of eternity. I think there are so many other issues that we'd love to raise with you tonight, Paul, but I think we'll uh, invite people to do that informally over a glass of wine and, of course, uh, to see if they can get some of the answers to your questions in your book. Uh, I think it's an There's so book. much more in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think what's, what's notable about the book, it's, it's that rare book that goes from the living room to the classroom. There are lots of books that are written for public consumption that you like to read over a cup of tea in the living room. They don't necessarily work very well in the classroom. Mm. And you know there are lots of ones that are written for the classroom that people don't necessarily want to bring into their living room. But this is one of those rare books that really works well in both those contexts, and I think we'll be studying it and enjoying it for a long time. So thank you for taking the time to chat with us this evening. Paul's day started this morning at 4.30 a.m. because he is quite sought after by the by various media outlets in the wake of this, uh, this defeat at the UN. And so we're thrilled that you took the time to share your insights with us here this evening. So please join me in thanking Paul Heinberg.